So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the panel, Race Relations and Military Occupation in the American South, 1861 to 1865. I'm Lorian Foote, the Patricia and Bookman Peters Professor in History at Texas A&M University, and the excellent papers in this panel um, will highlight how Black and white Union soldiers during the American Civil War implemented their own vision of occupation policy and how that intersected with local conditions and local actors and the, the civil military relations um, of their own officer corps. So I will introduce each panelist before each presentation, and then I will introduce our two commentators who will each speak for five minutes, and then we'll have a time of Q&A with the audience. So please submit your questions in the chat, and I will ask them of our panelists. So without further ado, because we want to have plenty of time for question and answer, our first presenter is Dr. Eric Totten of the University of Arkansas, whose paper is about the politics of emancipation for the 4th New Hampshire Infantry during the occupation of St. Augustine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Foote, uh, Dr. Manning, and Pinheiro. I greatly appreciate the, the honor of having you all here. Um, the soldiers of the 4th New Hampshire Volunteer Infantry reflected the communities in the south central part of the Granite State that sent them into the field. From 1828 to 1854, New Hampshire was described as the Gibraltar of the democracy and the South Carolina of the North due to their fervent support for the party of Jackson and their abhorrence of abolitionism. In the 1840s, mobs of Granite Staters chased off preachers and politicians who advocated for the abolition of slavery. Only the issues of nativism and the debate about slavery's extension into the Western territories broke the democracy's stranglehold over New England politics, despite uh, over New England politics. Uh, despite these electoral victories, many men who went to the war in 1861 carried with them constitutionally conservative, anti-abolitionist and nativist beliefs that they had learned and practiced in their home communities during the antebellum era. Um, is there a way to share my screen here, by the way? I should have done this beforehand. Um, I don't share my screen. Yes, um, at, the, at the bottom, uh -huh. uh, Eric, there's a bunch of buttons. There's a microphone, there's a one button next to it, and then next to it, there is like a, a rectangle with a red line through it. Okay, let me try that red line. Okay, I just had a little uh, slideshow here. I just wanted to show, make it easier. Can anyone no, see this? We can see it. Yeah. Okay. Um, raised from Belknap, Cheshire, Hillsboro, Rockingham, Merrimack, Stratford, and Stratford counties in the south central part of New Hampshire, the men who enlisted in the 4th New Hampshire Volunteer Infantry were typical of other New England communities. Shoemakers, carpenters, mechanics. Um, Eric, I'm sorry. I'm going to I'm going to interrupt you real quick. We're getting a couple of comments that some people aren't getting sound if you would turn on your caption. Okay. Uh, there should be a caption. Option is it that is a kid still nothing? Is there um, we, we don't want to spend too much time on it. So, so if, if you don't immediately see a caption button, Chandra, do you see if there's a caption button? I am looking and not finding. Okay. So, apologies to people who aren't getting sound. We we don't know what to do. So, <laughs> what about now? I'll just turn off the presentation. I'll just I, do I don't. I don't. It. it Keep going, Eric. Well, okay, thank you. Um, shoemakers, carpenters, mechanics, spinners, farmers, and other laborers made up the majority of the regiment's soldiers. Several companies were also filled with Irish immigrants from Manchester, which created some tension with nativists in the regiment. The officer corps came from prominent lawyers, merchants, and politically connected men in the Granite State. By March 1862, the regiment was led by Colonel Louis Bell, an ambitious 24 year old son of a powerful political family. Like many Northern men, Bell joined the U.S. Army after the firing on Fort Sumter, regarding it as his, quote, holy duty to God in my country. Like other men of his class, Bell also saw an opportunity to gain public recognition of his character, which he hoped could be used in a future political career. Common soldiers also declared their commitment to do their duty by fighting for their country. These men attempted to live up to what historian Andrew Bledsoe termed the citizen-soldier ethos, where native-born men would leave the comforts of home to perform military service for the public good. Few, if any, officers of the 4th ever declared their desire to fight for Black freedom. On March 22, 1862, Colonel Bell and the 4th New Hampshire officially began their occupation of St. Augustine, Florida. Bell considered the post an honor, 
but he was soon presented with what he called the most delicate issue, the quote unquote Negro question. From March to April, he requested instructions from his superior, General H.W. Benham, regarding slaves belonging to disloyal men. The colonel had furnished enslaved men and women with food and compelled them to work, though he excluded them from taking shelter inside Fort Marion in St. Augustine. Most men in the fourth, especially the Irish immigrants, held deeply racist views towards African Americans. Letters from their time in the South are filled with racial epithets, referring to African Americans as, quote, disgusting animals, monkeys, comical creatures, and worse. But Bell confessed to his wife that early experiences with African Americans deeply affected him. In one case, he interviewed a slave who had not been allowed to speak to his wife and children for over a year while another was forced to hide in the swamps for two years to avoid slave patrols. Perhaps worst of all, Bell saw the, quote, works of the lash all over the body of a 12-year-old girl. He informed his wife that he was, quote, nearly driven to abolitionism by the terrible scene. But Bell believed it was his solemn duty to, quote, support the Constitution, which he thought prevented him from prosecuting the guilty wretch who would flog this young child. As the months passed without direction from the Lincoln administration, Bell's sympathy for the plight of the refugees began to wane. He observed that the freed people understood that, quote, our being here makes them free. And as a result, they asserted their new status and mocked their former enslavers. Under slavery, black men and women had not been allowed in the streets without a pass from their owner. Now, under union occupation, their former enslavers had to get a pass after 9 p.m. to be in the streets. Bell wrote his wife that he had heard formerly enslaved people tell whites that they were the, quote, N-word now and had to go to Massa Bell for a pass. Bell also had difficulty navigating the racial geography of St. Augustine. The city not only had Southern whites and blacks, but also a sizable population of Menorcans left over from the British and Spanish periods. As a result, many of the enslaved were to Bell's eyes, quote, more or less white. Bell's frustration with African Americans peaked in late 18, in June 1862. Bell was angered by the, quote, constant complaints of theft, which he attributed to African Americans. As a result, he ordered the mayor of St. Augustine to, to nominate a police force of five citizens to, quote, arrest Negroes found idling about the streets during work hours. They would then be compelled to work with a ball and chain attached to their leg. He ordered the soldiers of the regiment not to interfere with the police, but he also forbade the police from inflicting punishment on any African-American, nor were they allowed to molest any refugee who came in from the countryside. Bell also had six squads of the 4th to patrol the streets after dark. Over the course of several days, a dozen African-American refugees were sent outside the pickets for stealing produce, and another 34 were confined to the guardhouse. One private in the regiment described the patrols as having, quote, plenty fun with the Negroes. On May 9, 1862, Major General David Hunter, the new commander of the Department of the South, issued General Order No. 11. He declared that the department was under martial law and declared that all slaves were free and urged the freedmen to join the military. This went beyond a similar decree by John C. Fremont in Missouri, which was issued in August 1861, uh, that excluded uh, ex uh, slaves of loyal masters. Hunter's goal was in part to begin the reversal of a conservative military culture that had reigned under the previous department commander, General Thomas W. Sherman, but, both, but some soldiers resisted. When a company of soldiers of the 4th heard about the order, they formed a mob and began attacking African-American people on the streets of St. Augustine. One private recorded in his diary that it was, quote, a memorable day for the N-words of this place, for some had been freed by the order of General Hunter, and all were knocked down by the order of the soldiers. President Abraham Lincoln later declared Hunter's order void as he had done Fremont's emancipation plan and distanced administration from Hunter's action. However, Lincoln did not censure Hunter, and this wiggle room allowed him to continue to push the Department of the South's conservative military culture towards a pro-emancipation one. Months passed as St. Augustine lived under martial law, and the administration still provided no guidance to commanders on African-American refugees. On July 28, 1862, General Hunter relieved Colonel Bell of command at St. Augustine and ordered him to be arrested and brought to departmental headquarters at Hilton Head, uh, South Carolina. 
Hunter remarked that it was, quote, with deep regret that he had learned about learned of reports against his officers returning fugitive slaves, quote, in direct violation of a law of Congress, which referred to the recently passed Second Confiscation Act. Hunter singled out the New England colonel under arrest who he sarcastically lambasted for doing the, quote, manly task of turning over a young woman whose skin was almost as white as his own to the cruel lash of her rebel master. On August 5th, Bell arrived at Hilton Head to give his account of, quote, the stewardship in the matter of the Negroes. Bell claimed he had strict orders from his superiors, General Sherman and others, not to interfere with the slaves belonging to loyal masters. Bell surmised that due to his conduct, Hunter did not think that he had been abolitionist enough. After reading Hunter's public rebuke, Bell immediately petitioned General in Chief Henry W. Halleck against the official expression of his assumed guilt, which he felt was tantamount to a guilty sentence in a general court martial. Bell hoped to, quote, get out of this miserable department as he was tired of the army, but only his sense of duty kept him in uniform. Bell explained his course of action to his wife and the generals at Hilton Head. He believed he had acted conscientiously towards African Americans, setting them free when he could and making their bonds bondage less hard when he could not free them. He insisted that he had intervened on behalf of uh, African Americans scores of times. He stated he was informed by his regimental surgeon that several houses of prostitution existed in St. Augustine and that they affected the health of the soldiers. As a result, Bell sent his provost marshal to put all prostitutes outside of the pickets with orders not to return. Um, as a result, Captain George F. Towell expelled eight black women and two white women. A few days later, Bell learned that the Secesh had attempted to capture the women he sent out and sell them as slaves. He ordered his cavalry to bring them back into the lines and have them, quote, locked up where they could do no more mischief. However, the owner of one of the girls, John Masters, who Bell described as a real union man, demanded her return. Bell refused, and the slave owner flew into a great rage, but in the end, he got his way. Because due to the conditions inside the fort, Bell had to discharge the girl from confinement, and she was seized by her enslaver. Bell realized he had no authority to take her from him and acknowledged that, considering her character, he did not have much disposition to do so. Under the old military culture of the department, Bell had never received orders against the return of the enslaved, and his conduct in this instance aligned with his previous decisions, which met no disapproval from his previous superiors. Captain Towell's account of the events um, support Bell's assertion. The one New Hampshire Democratic newspaper reported that the real reason Bell had to defend himself was because he did not believe blacks were, quote, any better than white folks. In addition, some soldiers of the fourth believed that Bell was removed, quote, on the account of the N-words, as our boys do not like them, in the whippings they gave them a short time ago, referring to that mob action in the streets. Bell was livid about the curiosity of this affair. As Hunter's general order, he claimed, was sent to the New York papers more than a week before he received it. The colonel believed that General Hunter was trying to create political capital at his expense, trying to sacrifice what he called an ambitious man, uh, an innocent man for his own ambition. Bell swore that if it were not for his darling wife and child, he would deliberately shoot Hunter, but he was willing to quietly wait until he could hear, till he could, could clear his character, and then he would ruin Hunter and, quote, make his ambition a curse to him. Bell's wife, Molly, was beside herself when she learned that her husband was the New England colonel described in General Hunter's order. Her writing became frantic and sloppy as she was overcome by anxiety and anger. The combined effect of her husband's absence and the slander against his character made her hate Hunter. Molly defended her husband vehemently and she suspected additional culprits. She believed that several company officers were all at the bottom of it as they were envious of his command and disagreed with his actions. With Bell under arrest, General Hunter sought to make an example of the 4th at Hilton Head. On August 19th, he directed the 7th New Hampshire Volunteer Infantry, 7th New Hampshire Volunteers, under Colonel H.S. Putnam to relieve the 4th. They were then to return to Hilton Head. When they arrived, he marched the regiment past some splendid places for encampment, they said, 
and ordered them to make camp in a wood and brush filled area, which took a week to clear away. All the while, the men were, quote, without tents, and the mosquitoes and gala nippers were thick enough to cut one up. Particularly infuriating for the soldiers was the fact that, quote, hundreds of N-words were quartered in good houses while the white soldiers slept outside. This refers to the building of Mitchellville on Hilton Head Island. As a result of the situation, the men were discouraged and reckless to the point that when they heard that, the, that rebels were in Maryland, many stated that they did not care if the Confederates whipped them. Others threatened that they would kill Old Hunter if given the chance. The soldiers could not believe the amount of meanness carried on in the army and stated that, quote, if an officer gets mad with another, he will injure the men out of spite. After his release by General John M. Brennan in early September, Bell still had to salvage his character. He took to northern newspapers to relay his side of the whole affair. Of the way, of whole affair. Uh, Colonel Bell wrote to the editor of the Independent Democrat, uh, the leading Republican organ in the state known for its abolitionist stance. In recounting his, the episode, Bell emphasized the presence, that the presence of prostitutes was injurious to the regiment and that he expelled all prostitutes regardless of color and status. Bell noted that there were no formal charges against him and that he had been restored to command without any official rebuke. The colonel asked for justice at the hands of the people of New Hampshire. And interestingly, in a draft of his letter, he blotted out the mention of him being an abolitionist in his innermost soul. And this illustrates that Bell would seize the mantle of abolitionism if he thought it gave him an edge in debates on the home front. But the letter did not have its desired effect. Bell received word from another officer recruiting in New Hampshire that the fourth was being slandered as, quote, very poorly officered, very intemperate, and were an armed mob having, having neither discipline nor drill. What was worse, there was talk of uh, merging the regiment with the 2nd New Hampshire and killing off the 4th entirely. A number of officers held consultations with the New Hampshire governor, Nathaniel S. Berry, himself an abolitionist, on behalf of the 4th, and asked Bell to get his superior's testimony that the regiment was an efficient body of men in the hopes of changing public opinion. While on Hilton Head, the regiment received new, uh, this news, and it created quite a storm of indignation among the men who had no intention of, quote, submitting to any such treatment. Uh, the officer also, um, these men also report that the fourth had been meanly slandered and urged their wives and family members not to believe the rumors. The public relations campaign worked, and Governor Barry later wrote Colonel Bell that he had never asked the War Department to disband or consolidate the regiment, though Bell doubted his sincerity. While the reports from the generals of the Department of the South had put an end to the discussion of disbandment, it could not restore the regiment's reputation. Um, while this flurry of politics swirled, the loyal citizens, quote unquote, of St. Augustine petitioned General Ormsby M. Mitchell uh, on behalf of Colonel Bell and the Fourth. The citizens believed that Bell had done no wrong when he was arrested and removed from the city due to quote, a mulatto woman of known bad character um, for chastity and virtue. Indeed, they argued that Bell had prevented, quote, her from insulting and injuring the feelings of virtuous white females of the city. They asked Mitchell to return Bell in the fourth after being wrongfully removed. The reasons for supporting the fourth by the citizens of St. Augustine or the white citizens of St. Augustine were confirmed by Calvin Shedd of the 7th New Hampshire Volunteers. After the fourth left the city, Shedd noted that the citizens, quote, liked the fourth first rate since they abused the N-words and left the whites to do as they pleased. This all ended when the seventh arrived and their colonel made the citizens take the oath of allegiance or go outside the lines, which, quote, made an awful growl. Uh, Private Young of the seventh saw things slightly differently, but uh, agreed overall with the assessment. He acknowledged that the fourth uh, was sent away from St. Augustine because, quote, they allowed themselves to become demoralized on the slavery question. Young thought Bell was a good man and that it was actually Bell's officers who had abused African-American refugees and had returned slaves without consulting Bell. He also supposed that there were a number of pro-slavery officers who had flirted with rebel women, and these women asked them if they had come south to, quote, protect Negro schools. These officers insisted to the women that they fought, quote, for the union and constitution as it was, and not the question of whether, quote, a Negro was as good as a white man. 
Young further related that while Bell was arrested, General Rufus Saxton, a prominent uh, proponent of enlisting African-Americans into the army, was, quote, mobbed in regular Southern style by the men of the 4th who should have protected him. Young believed that the whole regiment was not at fault, but just a series of pro-slavery officers who ought to be punished. Now, the petition and the statements of the soldiers of the 7th New Hampshire and uh, the citizens of St. Augustine seemingly confirms that some of the men and officers of the 4th had resisted this move towards emancipation policies, which, of course, was well received by the white citizens of St. Augustine. Many observers uh, at the home front and on Hilton Head concurred that the 4th had been too lenient on the white populace and too hard on the freed people. And this entire episode would affect Bell and his regiment's reputation throughout the war, leading to much consternation by the troops and their families. And in the end, I think this shows that the civil-military relationship had been strained as politicians, generals, officers, and soldiers disagreed about the politics of emancipation in 1862. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. That was excellent. Our second presenter is Dr. Madeline Forrest, Assistant Professor at the Virginia Military Institute. Madeline enjoys teaching at VMI where she can indulge her love of Virginia history and teach cadets the importance of local and community history. And her paper is about the Union occupation of Northern Virginia in 1862. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. And especially for those of you that are not in the Eastern time zone, thank you for waking up early. Um, so it looks like I have lost all ability to share screen. Is that the same for everybody? It won't let me even click on it. Okay. All right. Never mind. You'll have to use your imagination. I hope everybody's Virginia geography is up to date here. Um, so uh, my paper, as Dr. Foote mentioned, is dealing with Union occupation in Northern Virginia in early 1862. When they finally came, it was an unseasonably cold day in March of 1862, at a time when buds should have been forming on dogwood trees and the air filled with birdsong. The residents of Fauquier County, Virginia, were instead braving cold rains and late winter snowstorms. It seemed the weather, like everything else so far that year, was unpredictable. After weeks filled with nervous preparations and discussions as to whether it was necessary to evacuate, they watched President Abraham Lincoln's men march in with little fanfare. The people of Fauquier had dreaded this day for months as they watched the Union's army, Union Army's continued advance into Northern Virginia. Soon after taking control of nearby Loudoun County, the 28th Pennsylvania Infantry, under the command of Colonel John White Gary, entered Fauquier on March 15th. Just as Shakespeare's soothsayer warned Caesar, so did Providence attempt to warn Fauquier's residents, beware the Ides of March. From this point on, Union soldiers occupied Fauquier until the end of the Second Battle of Manassas in August. War had officially arrived for Fauquier and would not relent any time soon. This disruption of the lives of Fauquier's residents, this prison sentence, as many would consider it, continued until the end of the war. Warrington, the county seat, changed hands 67 times by 1865, more than any other city in the state with the exception of Winchester. Even before the county became closely associated with aiding and abetting John S. Mosby's partisans rangers, its location was seen as integral to the strategies of both armies. With several passes connecting it to the Blue Ridge Mountains in the western part of the county, Fauquier allowed an occupying army access to the ever-important Shenandoah Valley. The county was also only 90 miles from Richmond and 50 miles from Washington, D.C. The county's nickname of the Debatable Land was an accurate description. Thus, during this first occupation of the Union Army in the spring and summer of 1862, the residents of the county, both black and white, found themselves existing in a no-man's land where battle lines were blurred. This period illustrates the challenges in understanding the ways in which occupation not only altered Southerners' lives, but also influenced the changing strategy of war. And these challenges can best be illuminated at the local level. In places like Fauquier, new definitions of battlefield and home front are needed. The citizens were not combatants, but nor were they passive residents. The only way to understand and create these new definitions is to study the war the same way in which Southerners lived it, at the local level. If the residents of Fauquier wished to survive, all involved, enslaved and free, soldier and civilian, had to learn the new rules that governed life on the border. The presence of the Union Army was simultaneously detested and tolerated by Fauquier's white residents, especially the women who remained to protect their homes and farms. The main objective of the Union soldiers, part of General Urban McDowell's Corps of the Army of the Potomac, was to rebuild the county's infrastructure, including the railroad, sections of which had been destroyed by retreating Confederates. 
For the first time since the aftermath of the Battle of Manhasses, trains reached Warrington from Alexandria, and the telegraph lines extending from the nation's capital were repaired. Not all objectives were met quite that easily, however. A challenge faced in all wars, in addition to the necessity of sound infrastructure, is one of supplies. Fauquier's white residents quickly realized that their greatest challenge was protecting whatever food they still had left at the end of a long winter. Colonel Gary was forced to send out foraging parties to gather supplies, although he remarked, quote, many places were so impoverished that numerous difficulties were attendant upon getting our necessities. Gary's soldiers, who were adjusting to being occupiers in what for most of them was a strange land, also noticed the hardships already faced by many of the residents. Robert Davis, a member of Company D, 28th Pennsylvania, described Fauquier as, quote, splendid country, but very much neglected. Quote, I don't hardly see how the people live down here, he informed his family, for coffee is a dollar and a quarter and a pound and salt a dollar a pint and everything else in proportion. And they can't hardly get any at that price. Coffee and salt can hardly be had at any price. Despite those deprivations, Gary's men continued to confiscate food and livestock with little sympathy for the Confederate residents of Fauquier. Quote, the county has been ravaged by the enemy everywhere, a Union newspaper reporter wrote. And no locality has there been discovered sufficient supplies either for men or horses for one day. After a challenging winter that had only recently shown signs of abating, residents were struggling to feed their families and had little extra to sell to the Union Army. Spring planting had only just begun and it would be months before the residents could reap the benefits of the harvest. As Virginia T. Edmonds remarked, quote, I thought we were pretty well done with the villains and here comes three more wagons for something. How will we live? Ah, this is the way they are going to subdue the South, by starvation. Quote, they, meaning the Union Army, steal whatever they can lay their hands upon in the shape of corn, bacon, silver, etc., wrote a newspaper reporter from Warrington. They eat without invitation at every house they choose to call in at, and when they, call, when they are called on to pay, have it charged to Uncle Sam. And Uncle Sam was not yet done with Fauquier. When Ida Delaney, a wealthy plantation owner, asked soldiers to spare her children's pet steers, they told her, quote, if I did not want them killed, I ought not to have been for secession, and they drove them off. Having the Union Army occupy their towns and villages and farms completely altered the way in which Fauquier's residents viewed the Federals. Entering a home uninvited violated all acts of good taste and hospitality to which Virginians were accustomed. Having one's home searched and goods summarily taken was a violation of one's home and personal space, especially for women who were used to a certain level of protection being afforded them in the sanctity of the home. Union soldiers often demanded to search a house and would traipse all over it, top to tail, seeming purposefully to invade women's bedrooms, flinging open wardrobes and rifling through trunks. Not only was enemy occupation degrading for both men and women, as the men left in Fauquier were unable to do anything to protect their wives and daughters lest they face arrest, but it also made the war personal in a way neither party quite expected. The Southern press took advantage of such events to stroke patriotism, stoke patriotism. One report from Warrington recounting an attempt by a Union soldier to enter a young woman's bedroom reminded rebel men across the South why they were fighting for their liberty and property, but also to protect those nearest and dearest to them from these abominable Yankees. Yet there was very little the Confederates of Fauquier could do to protect themselves in this occupied world. They had little control over their lives. They could do nothing but stand and watch as Union soldiers loaded bushel after bushel of corn into a wagon itself taken from the family. Hearing shots fired in a pasture, families could only barricade themselves in the house as their cattle and hogs were slaughtered. Some, however, believed they still had agency. They locked their front doors and attempted to refuse entry to soldiers, while others, such as the Delaney and Edmonds families, went so far as to complain to the officers in charge of the degradations they were facing. Yet this was false agency, a false sense of security. It is human nature to want to protect oneself, to attempt to do something, anything, that might allow one to cling to dignity and self-preservation, to maintain a world where laws and orderliness existed, where a woman could expect protection from hordes of men running loose on her property. The white residents of Fauquier were beginning to realize, however, that they could no longer count on those expectations. While the Union soldiers who ran roughshod through the county frustrated some Union officers, such as Gary, others were prescient enough to understand that this was the cost of war. It was a lesson the residents of Fauquier would be forced to learn over and over. War was messy, with their husbands and brothers not around to protect them. It fell to women to defend their homes and property as they were forced to fill what traditionally had been masculine roles. 
board did not respect gender barriers, family ties, and certainly not property lines. Yet despite the destruction and overwhelming number of complaints, these first union occupiers were fairly well behaved, and the requisitioning of food and livestock was within the realm of what an army required when further away from its sources of supply. Despite warnings from newspapers and worried rumors, Union soldiers did not burn homes and barns or rape white women and their daughters in, the, in Fauquier. This attempt at conciliatory behavior by the Union Army was driven by a desire, which originated with Lincoln, to wink at, weaken the secessionists loyal to the Confederacy and win the latent Union's support in Fauquier and elsewhere throughout Virginia that the U.S. government hoped still existed. As a result, most soldiers were remarkably well behaved, especially when it came to the treatment of women. There was even some respect shown to the men still at home. Robert E. Scott, a delegate from Virginia to the Provisional Confederate Congress, spoke of the necessity of secession to the Union soldiers staying with him and face no repercussions. Scott even managed to have released several of the men who were arrested for aiding Confederate soldiers when the U.S. Army first arrived. While the most rabid secessionists would never admit it, the Union soldiers had not been sent by the devil. Like Scott, the women of the county made their views on secession and the war known. Women like Ida Delaney, T. Edmonds, and Betty Snyder were forced to learn how to operate in, the, in this world that required more of them. Limited supplies, waves of refugees, and constant apprehension about the future introduced a fractured life to Virginia unlike anything anyone had seen. Young single women, <clears throat> such as T. and Betty, sometimes reveled in the myriad of new people they met and the excitement around them. However, what was a thrilling whirlwind of events for some Bells was a period of struggle and desperation for others who were beginning to understand the world in which they had been raised to inhabit was no more. Married women found themselves in charge of large farms and households, managing slaves and raising children on their own. It was a daunting task made even more difficult by the fact they were also constantly thinking about their husbands, brothers, or sons in harm's way. Supposedly defenseless women fought back by refusing to let the Union Army take advantage of them. They, in their own way, would not allow the Union soldiers to feel or even be victorious. The anger and frustration they felt about the loss of their loved ones, the ways in which their world was falling apart, and their inability to prevent this, was directed at the Yankees. While they did not become soldiers in the traditional sense, Fauquier's women began fighting their own battles on their front porches, in their parlors, and while riding horseback through their fields. They defended themselves and their family's beliefs and actions, and at this point in time, faced little, if any, consequences. T. Edmonds found herself standing at her back door having a heated argument with three Union soldiers over the current state of affairs. When she asked one of them why he was fighting, he replied, replied, quote, you have broken up one of the finest governments that ever existed and we want to restore it. T. retorted, quote, ha ha, the idea, and challenged him to explain, quote, where the fuss originated and how we could do otherwise under the circumstances. Although these exchanges sometimes angered the soldiers, both sides seemed to enjoy the sparring matches with T con concluding, quote, my little fellow spoke well, though, and I admired him for it. As this story illustrates, the soldiers did little in response to the women beyond giving the occasional retort or arguing with residents. And for the most part, they did not arrest outspoken Confederates. As these, as these events occurred roughly a month before General Benjamin Butler issued his infamous General Order Number 28 to the women of New Orleans, there was not yet a precedent for how to handle the actions of secessionist women towards Union soldiers. For the time being, white women continued to be afforded the protection their race and gender had always given them. In return, as much as many residents detested the Union soldiers, if the men were polite, and especially if they were officers, many women grudgingly shared their food and even sat with them at the dining table. As Betty Snyder noted, it was a complicated relationship with benefits and drawbacks for both sides. Quote, suffice it to say, the amount stolen from us, though not small, was nothing compared to the trials of insolence while shooting the poultry before our very eyes, Betty wrote in August of 1862. The Ninth New York is still provost in Warrenton. They act to us more as friends than enemies and are anxious to fight Southerners. They keep us supplied with their latest papers. With the number of complaints to union officers regarding stolen food, food and livestock, many families, including uh, T. Edmonds's and Betty Snyder's, were even able to procure union guards for their houses. Whether the men were invited in or forced a meal to be prepared, it was hard for the social norms of hospitality to cease, which is not to say it was always tranquil. A group of officers eating with T. and her family could not resist remarking on the beauty of the area. Quote, they are very chatty and extremely inquisitive as to the country and farming, T observed. One remarked, referring to a Union soldier, 
Virginia was a garden spot. Indeed, it was a beautiful and fine country. Now, this is T's own words. Yes, and I hope you may all get a home on her soil no, la no larger than six by three. Social mores were being observed, but there were cracks underneath the surface. The fact that these known secessionists were comfortable arguing with Union soldiers and did not fear any repercussion strikes at the heart of the debate between the home front and the battlefield and the fluidity of that border. Many people expected this war to be a quote unquote traditional one in which both sides would be aided by loyal supporters when possible, but also one in which civilians themselves enjoyed a certain degree of protection. Yet by late spring 1862, it was becoming apparent, especially to Lincoln and his government, that a change toward Confederate civilians was needed. The unionism Lincoln had believed was simply dormant in the South had not emerged. As these examples have shown, civilians were not uninvolved and women were proving to be one of the biggest obstacles to union success. Ida demanded she be left alone because she was an innocent woman with mouths to feed, but she was not innocent. As one Union soldier told her, they continued to raid her house because her husband, quote, was a rebel and they were suffering for the corn and must have it. It was not only the white inhabitants of Fauquier who had their world turned upside down when Union soldiers first appeared. The war shook society to its moorings, including the relationship be between the enslaved and their masters. Out of a population of 21,706 in 1860, Roughly half of that, about 48%, 10,455, in case you're curious, were enslaved, a population that made Fauquier one of the largest, one of, or one of the larger slaveholding counties in the state. And this half of the county experienced the war in a very different way. With the arrival of the Union Army, Fauquier's slaves, recognizing a chance at freedom, flocked to Union camps. In this way, living on the border between two armies and two countries worked in their favor. While the white citizens worried over how long occupation would last, the county's African-Americans rejoiced at their good fortune in being so close not only to the Union Army, but also Washington, D.C., a gateway to the north and the closest city to have outlawed the slave trade. Location really was everything in this war, and living on the shifting border was either godsend or a terrible situation, depending on the color of your skin. While the slaves of Fauquier celebrated the arrival of the Union Army, it was not a one-sided relationship. As Union soldiers began to make themselves comfortable in the outer reaches of Northern Virginia, they began to learn a lot more about the area, both geographically and socially, as well as the locations of various brigades and companies of the Confederate Army from information provided by local slaves. Reporting on troop numbers, location of Confederate camps, and rebel weapons, runaway slaves were such a font of information that Alan Pinkerton, the Union Army's intelligence chief, instructed his operatives to interview contrabands when they arrived in Union camps. White residents were at least a little aware of the subterfuge, but whether it made them alter their conversation around slaves is not clear. T. Edmonds in April of 1862 noted that Union soldiers were receiving information, quote, through the influence of their darky friends and whom they place the utmost confidence. Their word is law, said the soldiers, and what the darkies can't tell them is not worth hearing, end quote. Union soldiers Union soldier Davis echoed T's words when writing home to his father and describing how some soldiers had taken food from a secessionist family. He explained that the slaves on the plantation often told soldiers what the family was saying about the Union Army and divulged what stores of food and other supplies the family had concealed. Union soldiers also took advantage of the sympathies of the enslaved. Davis recounted, quote, we have a slave that cooks for us. His master had 200 slaves. He was hired at Upperville. We got him when we was there, end quote. While the enslaved continued to claim their freedom, for the loyal Confederates, life only worsened. In June 1862, Lincoln called General John Pope from the West and placed him in charge of the newly formed Army of Virginia. This represented a clear change in strategy for the Union war effort in the East that had major consequences for the people of Northern Virginia. It was with Pope that Lincoln and Secretary of War Edwin Stanton first pioneered the total war strategy most associated with Ulysses S. Grant, William Tecumseh Sherman, and Philip Sheridan. While Union leaders were ultimately unsuccessful in 1862, Lincoln did not give up on expanding the reach of war. Despite Pope's failures to bring war to the people, it was the white residents of Fauquier and their counterparts across Virginia that led to this change in plans. Women like Ida, T, and Betty were not innocent civilians. They fought in the only ways they knew how, and as a result, altered Union tactics for the rest of the war. Union soldiers may have sometimes been, quote, more friends than en enemies, end quote, in 1862, again illustrating the many blurred lines between home front and battlefield in this war. 
But that tenuous relationship would be shattered in the days and weeks to come as Fakir continued to struggle under the weight of occupation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Forrest. Our final presenter is uh, Dr. Ian Davis. As a scholar at Mississippi State University, he's given a lot of papers on the Cold War, but his true passion is the intersection of military and political history, which he addresses in his just successfully defended dissertation uh, on the uh, military and political history of black soldiers in 19th and 20th century America. And his paper is about how USCT occupation of the departments of the Gulf and the South and how black soldiers who served there shape the future service of black soldiers. Uh, Dr. Davis, unfortunately, um, I assume this, I saw everyone's face, so I assume this is happening for everyone. You are totally electronic. We cannot hear your voice. Is that, is that what everyone else is hearing? I can hear, it's like cutting in and out, like the video is great, but the audio is kind of going like every other like word, it seems like. It's like sort of. Can you, can you try one more time? See, I wonder if you came, drop out and come back in maybe. I, this is a troubleshoot. Yeah, Dr. Davis, drop out and come back in. And then if that doesn't work, your paper is excellent and I will read it <laughs> with my exciting uh, reading voice that I have <laughs> because it must be heard. So if, if you can't communicate it, I will. And you can make faces while I read it <laughs> so that it'll look like it's coming from you. <clears throat> so, um, Hillary Green is saying, have everyone else go on mute and let's see if that works. Um, In, in, do you have headphones or another mic? We, we can't hear you, but we assume you're saying you're going to another room to try to get another mic. Okay, we'll give you a couple minutes. And if that doesn't work, then like I said, I will read the paper. Because let me assure everyone who is waiting for this, it really is a good paper. <laughs> and so you do want to, you do want to hear this paper. Um, so I have no training in being the, um, you know, what's the phrase in entertainment where you're the person who's supposed to entertain and talk through when there's when there's a glitch. Um, <laughs> oh, good. The MC. MC. <laughs> the MC, thank you. Actually, we, we did that or we could use a sports announcer here who could say, know. you know. Uh, <laughs> well, hopefully this will work. Let me mute myself. Okay, Ian, we're very sorry. That's very disappointing. But I, as I told everyone while you were trying to get your earphones, your paper is excellent. And so um, it must be heard. And so I will start, I will read it. If if maybe you can chat with, uh, chat with someone to try to find a solution and you can jump in if, if we can figure it out. Um, but, but I, you know, we need to keep going so we can get to the comments. Uh, so I, the only thing I can think of to do is I, I have read his paper and I'm actually a good reader. I read to, I have a little free library and I read to children all the time. So I have a lot of good practice. Um, so I will do my best for Ian's paper. 
The title of it is The U.S. Colored Troops' Way of War, Rescue, Retaliation, and Occupation in the Departments of the Gulf and South. By the time of the Red River War in 1874, First Sergeant Jacob Wilkes was what the artist and correspondent Frederick Remington would have characterized as an old sergeant. Not only a senior non-commissioned officer in the 9th United States Cavalry, one of four U.S. Army regiments composed of colored persons, quote unquote, Wilkes had previously served in the 116th U.S. Colored Infantry, in which he, quote, saw hard service under U.S. Grant in his Virginia campaigns. For men like Wilkes, whose USCI regiment had served in Texas as part of the 15th Corps in Major General Philip H. Sheridan's Army of Observation. Service in the 9th U.S. Cavalry was simply a return to familiar territory and duties. Yet as Wilkes and many other Black veterans discovered, duty in the West would prove equal parts familiar and distinct in their military experiences. During the Red River War, 1st Sergeant Wilkes and six companies of the 9th Cavalry participated in the destruction of several Indian villages on the Staked Plains. During their approach of one village, Wilkes and his men encountered Indian women who, quote, fought like demons who otherwise would have been spared, alongside with the 112 prisoners the troopers took during the operation. In the aftermath of the skirmish, Wilkes and his men confiscated, quote, a vast store of dried turkey and buffalo meat, other foodstuffs, and a few buffalo pelts before burning the Indians' dwellings, firearms, ammunition, and remaining pelts. Such operations not only doomed Indians who refused to live on reservations to death from starvation and exposure during the winter months, but revealed the extirpative nature of the war on the plains. Blood had, bloodshed, however, did not cease with the destruction of the village. Some prisoners, particularly the younger men, remained unwilling to return to the reservations and, quote, committed suicide by batting out their own brains, unquote. While younger prisoners posed a risk to themselves, the Black troopers had learned to be particularly cautious around the few female prisoners they took into custody. During a previous scouting expedition, quote, a beautiful Apache girl, whom Wilkes's men had captured and seated on a horse behind a trooper, had attempted to draw his pistol and kill him several times, leading the Black cavalrymen, quote, to kill this prisoner rather than to take another risk, unquote. Wilkes and the other cavalrymen did not relish in such actions and even feared court martials for doing so, but they would slay an Indian prisoner regardless of sex with, quote, nothing more said, unquote, if they posed a danger to the troopers. Such operations, however, were neither novel nor aberrant within the experiences of black soldiers of the Civil War and early postbellum eras. As Mark Grimsley correctly maintains, the Army's war against the Plains Indians was neither a direct continuation nor amplification of the hard war policy against Confederate civilians and resources, but connective tissue existed between these irregular conflicts in the form of black soldiers. Veterans of the U.S. colored troops who had waged their own unconventional wars against slavery and guerrillas as soldiers in the departments of the Gulf and South were the, quote, class of men who formed the nucleus of enlisted strength, unquote, in the newly established Black U.S. Army regiments. Though not formally trained counterinsurgency fighters like later elite Army units, the men of the USCT nevertheless became adept unconventional warriors in the Civil War, and such experiences would define subsequent modes and traditions of Black military service. While massive deadly engagements such as the Louisiana Native Guard's charge at Fort Hudson or the 54th Massachusetts Volunteers' more famous assault on Fort Wagner became critical to the creation of, black citizen, of a black citizen soldier tradition, USCT volunteers in the departments of the Gulf and the South primarily served as troops of occupation. Although such duties removed the USCT from the conventional front lines of the Civil War, Union policy on black military service ironically placed USCT volunteers on the front lines of emancipation in occupation duty. In the departments of the Gulf and South, which possessed much of North America's enslaved population and were some of the earliest black volunteer regiments entered service, black soldiers became agents of emancipation. For freedmen, military service offered a vehicle for freeing themselves, liberating loved ones, and destroying the remaining vestiges of slavery. But in doing so, they met resistance from both planters and union authorities. 
Occupation not only placed Black volunteers in positions of nominal power and authority over civilians, who in the case of some enlistees might have been their former owners or held their wives and families in bondage. In August of 1863, a party of four Black soldiers representing themselves as belonging to the first Louisiana Native Guards with passes signed by the um, Assistant Adjutant General of Brigadier General Ullman came into St. Bernard Parish, quote, for the alleged purpose of recruiting. The Native Guardsmen, however, had, quote, visited plantations of loyal and peaceable men, unquote, not to recruit, but to transport men and women, men, women, and children from the plantations to New Orleans. In a similar operation, another group of Native Guardsmen, quote, visited the plantation of Mr. E. Villier and loaded their muskets in front of his door before demanding some colored women who they called their own wives. While such operations represented a process of remasculization through which the men of the USCT performed patriarchal duties of which slavery had deprived them, they also fell well outside of Union emancipation and military policy. During the early phases of the war, Lincoln sought to avoid a violent and remorseless revolutionary struggle that, mil that a militarized emancipation could potentially cause. And his final draft of the Emancipation Proclamation reflected such caution. Not only did the document encourage freedmen, quote, to abstain from all violence unless in necessary self-defense, but emphasized their place in the armed service of the United States. Through service in the Union Army and its garrisons, the president hoped to channel and moderate freedmen's grievances against slavery, while also placating the slaveholders within the Union and Union-controlled territories. By limiting emancipations to states in rebellion against the United States, as well as exempting occupied areas such as St. Bernard's Parish and other parts of Louisiana with profitable plantations in Union hands, the Emancipation Proclamation constrained the ability of Black volunteers to act as agents of abolition. In the case of the Native Guardsmen's extra-legal operation, Union authorities not only returned the seized property to the proper owners, but advised the women and children who had absconded with the soldiers to return to their plantations. While USCT volunteers could menace pro-Union plantation owners and often strayed beyond the limits of President Lincoln outlined in the Emancipation Proclamation, even more prejudiced Union commanders could appreciate the value of the USCT as an occupying force. While he, quote, opposed the organization of colored regiments and considered Black men to be, quote, in a state of transition, Major General William T. Sherman relied on contingents of the USCT to, quote, prevent the smaller bands of Confederate guerrillas from approaching the river plantations on which free Black laborers worked for Union loyalists. Alongside these duties, Black volunteers also engaged in foraging and scouting operations, such as in the case of Sergeant Major James Anderson and men of the 31st U.S. Colored Infantry, who confiscated poultry, meat, tobacco, corn, and horses during an 1864 raid in Virginia. Through both the securing and expropriation of resources and occupation duty, the USCT served as a counterinsurgency force behind the front lines. Counterinsurgency operations of the USCT, however, extended beyond constabulary duty and foraging. In the Department of the Gulf, U.S. Colored Cavalry, the USCC, troopers exemplified the potential of Black soldiers as a counterinsurgency force. Late in August of 1864, 200 guerrillas who regularly cooperated with, re with the regular rebel forces raided the Tibbetts Plantation in Goodrich's Landing, Landing, Louisiana, killing two scouts after they had surrendered, black laborers, and a white, overseer named, white overseer named Webster, whom they, quote, murdered as soon as they reached Bayou Tensas. In response, Colonel A. Watson Weber of the 55th, 51st U.S. Colored Infantry deployed over 200 troopers of the 3rd USCC under Major Charles Chaplin to, quote, pay them a retaliatory visit. During this visit, the troopers found a saddle belonging to one of the murdered scouts and two black laborers taken from the Tibbetts Plantation in the home of a Mr. Washburn who Major Chaplin gave five minutes to remove his goods before setting fire to the house and every building on the plantation as punishment for his association with the guerrillas. 
At the guerrillas' rendezvous point, the troopers slew several squads of guerrillas, and upon arriving to the town of Floyd, Major Chaplin gave the inhabitants the same notice as he had given to Mr. Washburn, then burned four-fifths of the town. In contrast to the wanton, vindictive destruction that Colonel James Montgomery's 2nd South Carolina volunteers inflicted upon Darien, Georgia, the 3rd USCC troopers used the destruction of property for the pragmatic purpose of punishing and deterring guerrillas and civilians who collaborated with them. Other encounters between Black volunteers and white Southern civilians in the Department of the Gulf proved bloodier and reflective of the racial prejudices Black soldiers could expect from the White South. In November of 1864, USCC and USCI detachments engaged in a counterinsurgency operation in a small town called Mariana in West Florida, where they encountered a very different and perplexing enemy. White Union cavalrymen had refused to, insult, to assault the town, but the Black cavalry, as Sergeant A.J. Bedford of the 25th USCI observed, proved eager to raise the town and roust its Confederate holdouts out of hiding. While the holdouts fled, the town's women did not, and quote, fired out of the windows and every by place they met the troopers and even wounded and killed several white officers until USCI companies rushed on the women with fixed bayonets. Women, as Stephen Ash contends, were the vanguard of verbal defiance, but guerrilla resistance tended to exhibit a more masculine ethos. Yet in Mariana, women's resistance transcended typical gender norms. Mariana not only reflected Black volunteers' willingness to engage in unconventional warfare, but also proved instructive on how white civilians would meet Black soldiers in times of war and peace. As long feared racial others in the federal blue, the men of the USCT represented one of the most provocative and radical aspects of the Civil War, with which Union policymakers and commanders had to deal. While Union policies that isolated them to fatigue duty and the low intensity conflict of occupation and counterinsurgency, such policies also fostered a Black military tradition of unconventional warfare. Black volunteers' familiarity with the territories they occupied in the Gulf and the South coupled with their desire to eradicate the institution and legacies of slavery, made them some of the Union Army's most eager and capable irregular warriors. While excellence in unconventional warfare lent itself to wartime occupation, Black volunteers and veterans attracted vicious attacks in Memphis and New Orleans in 1866, a trend which would continue through Reconstruction, and Union commanders such as Major General Henry Halleck saw no role for them in the South. Southern violence, as well as crises in the West, such as General Kirby Smith's Confederate Army in Texas, the French puppet regime in Mexico, and rising tensions with Indians that the earlier Sand Creek Massacre caused, set the stage for Black deployment, deployment to the West. Lieutenant General U.S. Grant believed Black soldiers would perform better on the plains than dissatisfied white volunteers, and Black soldiers' proficiency at unconventional warfare would continue to define Black military service. As a correspondent for the nation reported in 1871, the active, intelligent, and resolute Black regulars, quote, appear to be rather superior to the average of white men at fighting the Comanche. This aptitude for Indian fighting, however, was not an independent development, but rather a continuation of the unconventional combat and occupational duties of the USCT in a different region and context. While Black volunteers represented a source of controversy in the departments of the Gulf and the South, the USCT's way of war would continue as its volunteers became Black regulars who fought in the Imperial Arms of America. I hope I did your paper justice, Ian. <laughs> so we have two excellent uh, commentators uh, for this panel. I'll introduce both of them, and then they'll go one after the other in the order on the program. So first is Dr. Chandra Manning. She teaches U.S. history at Georgetown University, is the author of Troubled Refuge, Struggling for Freedom in the Civil War, and is working on a history of the South in 14 places. The second is Dr. Holly Pinheiro, Assistant Professor of Amer African American History at Furman University and author of the forthcoming book, 
the family civil war, black soldiers and the fight for racial justice, um, which we're all very excited about. Uh, all right. Um, for some reason, I thought Holly went first. I'm sorry for the delay. Uh, so first of all, thank you, Lauren. Thank, thank you to all who made this panel happen, if not in the way we originally envisioned. Uh, we're constantly adapting to abnormal times, but of course, so too were those who lived through the Civil War. So in a weird way, it might be beneficial for us to experience in some very small measure that sense of constant, usually unwelcome adaptation that Civil War Americans experienced. So, so maybe that helps your day feel a little bit better, uh, Dr. Davis. Anyway, thank you to all who made this panel happen. And thanks especially to the paper authors for the opportunity to engage with your work. I think that these three papers taken together, and that's what I want to do. I want to think about what these three papers taken together invite us to think about rather than address them individually, just to the, for the sake of time. So um, I think that these three papers taken together really invite us to change direction in one key way. So I'd like to name that way. And then I'd like to reflect on three themes that I think we might see differently or better when we change direction in the way we're invited to by these papers. So first, what do I mean by change direction? Well, usually when we encounter scholarship, we read an article or a book, we move from the general to the specific. In the opening paragraph, we want to see the argument to provide a general framework. And then we work our way down toward the specific details that provide the evidence to support that framework. There are excellent ways, or there are excellent reasons why we usually you know, proceed that way. It's what we try to get our students to do for good reason, because it's easier to figure out where we're going when we do that. But that direction, also means that we generally encounter a scholar's findings from the opposite direction that they did. Because as historians, we usually start with the specifics of our evidence and ask questions and draw conclusions and only then arrive at the argument. So by change direction, I mean that these three papers taken as a whole, I think actually recreate in a very helpful way that specific to general direction that we usually follow as historians. These three papers, um, each starts in a specific place in time. Each grounds us in the particular. And so we're invited into the particular company of men from New Hampshire who find themselves in St. Augustine, Florida. We are invited to begin in a specific place and time of Fauquier County in 1862. And we're invited into the particular experiences of USCT soldiers in the wartime deep south and Gulf and then in the post-war West. And I think that by peering closely at these particular experiences, these papers invite us to step away momentarily from the big picture. But paradoxically, this very perspective then challenges us to think differently about some of the war's largest themes and questions. So again, I think that by starting in these specific places with these three papers, we might for a moment be stepping away from the big picture, but there are three really big questions I think that doing so invites us to see a little bit differently than we might otherwise. The first of those is military emancipation as a phenomenon, both necessary and awful. Necessary because slavery was so deeply rooted in the nation, so extraordinarily powerful that nothing short of armed force had proven able to uproot it. No matter how powerfully enslaved people desired freedom, there was no way their owners were going along with that without a fight. So it took an armed force wielded by nothing less than the national state to really take a crack at slavery in the United States. But as Ed Ayers and Scott Nesbitt, who I think is here, Nesbitt at least, have, uh, have put it, armies are really unreliable vehicles for emancipation, bringing heartbreak as well as liberation. There's a temptation for us to pick a side, to decide if military emancipation was necessary or awful, if its real meaning was heartbreak or liberation. I think that these three papers taken together do a wonderful job of insisting on the and and not settling for a more comfortable or. Necessary and awful, heartbreak and liberation. The second theme, I think, is the tension between military and civil authority which is not a tension we're as attuned to these days, but that was a really imperative issue for Civil War Americans. Whether something was done by civil or military authority and what the implications of each of those was, that really feels like hair splitting to us when we view the big picture, like policy towards civilians or emancipation. But it was not hair splitting to Civil War Americans. It was crucially important. And the close focus of these papers helps us see that tension playing out in real time. And then the final theme that I think we're invited to see in a different light 
is the persistent threat of re-enslavement. We know that the war ended slavery, and we'd like to tell ourselves that once slaves decided not to be slaves anymore, slavery was doomed. Emancipation was imminent. No power on earth could stop it. But powers on earth had certainly stopped and reversed wartime emancipation in the past. The most focus of these papers invite us, invites us to see that real possibility for re-enslavement existed in the United States, and therefore to ask a question we might otherwise miss, and that is, how did that not happen in the Civil War? I mean, certainly when we look at the men from New Hampshire in St. Augustine, that, that reality looks very real in a way that we overlook if we just see the big picture. So collectively, these three papers invite us to examine these questions closely from different angles. It's a little bit like picking up a gemstone, I think, and examining its facets in different lights. With each turn of these papers, we see a glint that we haven't seen before. Now, we don't see everything. And if we only look at the local, the refracted light can become a distortion because it blinds us to other times and places around the globe and across the centuries when people experience things that Civil War Americans experienced warfare, state building, and the like. And so another valuable reminder that these papers provide is the reminder that we still seek a historical lens that none of us have yet crafted. And that's the lens that allows us to see the local and the particular and the global and the transnational at the same time. We would all love that lens. None of us has made it yet. Um, but until we have it, we have valuable works like these that invite us to shift direction, to change perspective, and to see something new. So thank you to the authors of these papers for inviting us to do that. I don't know how I go after that, that uh, Dr. Manning, that was amazing. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank the conference organizers for holding this event virtually. I'm also grateful to be a commentator on this important and amazing panel. For sake of time, I'm gonna jump right into discussing the work. So these three papers illustrate that there remains so many nuanced ways to study the American Civil War that can provide more insights into the lives of people, black, white, Native American, men, and women. If we ever hope to better understand the impact of war on the people who lived it, but are often placed at the peripheries of academic and public discourses. Their collective work reinforces to me that terms such as war, battle, military tactics, battlefront, and home front need to continue being, re, uh, being modified to reflect the reality of life for people at the time. All of the scholars denote civilians and both armies for various, and, uh, for various reasons and circumstances might provide counterpoints to our current interpretations of their lives. More simply, as Dr. Forrest states, quote, war was messy, end quote. One of the most important themes that the panel does exceptionally well is centering their papers on the importance of an intersectional approach that examines issues of race, gender, class, and place. Doing so uncovers how USCT officers, soldiers, Native Americans in the West, Southern free people, Confederate and civilian, uh, United States civilians attempted to navigate the tumultuous era during and immediately following the close of the Civil War. It is clear that the war reshaped various people, their homes, and even the environments, both in rapid and profound ways. In short, no one escaped the impact of the war as people battled for their survival. Another commonality between the papers that I found fascinating was how the varied interactions with the US Army led soldiers and civilians to disagree about how the military could and did exercise its authority. For instance, some question whether the US Army and federal government should use a hard war policy on Confederate Virginians. If before the Emancipation Proclamation, the military should liberate and protect enslaved people. Or how black military service contributed to the oppression of various Western Native American tribes. Reading through these points had me thinking of the scholarship of Amy Morrell Taylor, Shandra Manning, Tara Hunter, and others who discussed the precarious living situations for newly freed people residing in or near U.S. Army lines. Lisa Tendrick Frank's work comes to mind when thinking about how Southern civilians were at war for their survival as well, as does Elizabeth Leonard, who provides insight on Black military service in the post-Civil War era. Yet they show that we still need to dig deeper and continue asking new questions. Each paper leaves me wondering where their projects might go from here, which I'm excited to hear about and continue to follow. I would like to offer some questions that I'm left with and possible avenues um, to look to expand your work if you choose to do so. Uh, Dr. Forrest, you offer a compelling argument about how the war forced Confederate Virginia women to redefine notions of gender to survive. 
I was struck by your point about their defiance against the U.S. Army and federal government policies uh, that were, quote, one of the biggest obstacles for the Union's success, end quote. I wondered how extending your analysis on enslaved people in the area would provide a counterpoint to your important argument. Also, this is just a question for me. Uh, do you think that this occupation that you talk about may have later influenced the Confederate Army to bring the war to Pennsylvania communities and particularly free blacks in those areas? Because that's what I was, um, it, it kept coming to mind as I read your work. Uh, let's see, for Dr. Davis, uh, how might your ideas about black, black military service in the West further illustrate how notions of militarized black manhood came at the detriment of another historically marginalized group? Because that to me was extremely compelling and I loved it. Uh, furthermore, was there any discourse of this in the black press? And what I was really thinking of was um, the Christian Recorder, the Weekly Anglo-African, just to name a few, because of their importance in constantly talking about black military service. Many soldiers actually write their experiences to those presses. Um, so it's just something to think about. And Dr. Totten, how does Molly Bell's wartime experiences differ from other partners of U.S. Army officers or possibly even Confederates as well? And why do you believe, which I agree, we must connect what is happening in northern communities and to families if we better want to, if we want to better understand uh, what it was like for those serving? Thank you. Thank you so much for these excellent uh, comments. So I'm going to give each panelist a moment to reflect on the points that Dr. Pinheiro and Dr. Manning brought up. And then I, they did such a great job sticking within the time frame as I asked them before the panel, because even in a virtual setting, I really do think the best panels have some time for the audience to engage. So I'll give each of them a, a moment to reflect on the comments, and then I'm going to open it up to the chat. You can post a question in the chat, or there's a Q&A button as well, and I will be sure and read those and pass them on to our panelists. So Dr. Forrest, can you take a moment to reflect on the comments? Sure. Yes. Thank you so much. This was so helpful. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, really, I, I really appreciate the way that Dr. Manning kind of envisioned our papers. I think, uh, you know, it's kind of one of those things like when you're in your little hole uh, that, you know, I'm, I'm always afraid that I'm, I'm too much in the weeds, you know, but it, it was it was interesting to kind of see it framed in that way, because especially it was also nice to see that there's other people <laughs> that are also um, doing a more kind of localized study and to kind of see the way that that's then helping frame larger these larger questions, because I, I don't want to speak for the other two, but I would say that's probably what we're all trying to do here, right? Add our add our uh, unique understanding to these these big questions from this from this little period. So I really appreciate that. Um, and for Dr. Pinero, um, again, yeah, I, I think the way all both of you were able to see the way the three papers fit together was was really interesting. Um, and especially your point about extending the analysis to enslaved people. That is something I'm continuing to work on as, you know, as we're all familiar, it's a little bit harder. The sources are not as present as, you know, white women who left these handy diaries behind. Um, so yes, that is something I'm working on. And to your larger question of leads to occupation in Pennsylvania, I would say yes, definitely. <laughs> um, because this occupation of the Union Army happens back and forth so many times in Northern Virginia, these women are just writing scathing letters to the men. Um, and so their husbands are constantly deserting and constantly coming home. Um, and the fact that so much food and supplies is constantly being taken um, I think that definitely impacts the desire to to head north and then that kind of retaliation effect, because a lot of the women's brothers and husbands are in Pennsylvania with all of that. The the detachments from Fauquier for the Confederate Army are up there. And so I definitely would think that that has um, well, not would think um, for some of the writings. I know that that's they're thinking about their their own occupation. So I thought that was a great question. Yeah. Um, so thank you. All right, Dr. Totten, do you have uh, any thoughts? Uh, yes, like uh, like Dr. Forrest said, I'd like to uh, thank all of you for your, for your great questions. Unfortunately, I, I, my thing dropped out halfway through Dr. Manning's brilliant response, so I, I cannot speak to the whole thing. But I did, uh, like uh, Dr. Forrest said, appreciate you putting it in a broader lens, especially since a lot of us are doing, I guess, community studies is what we would say. And like, like Madeline said, we kind of get into the weeds and then bringing that out helps us find connections between these works. Um, to Dr. Uh, Pinheiro's point, um, 
absolutely, I see a large part of my uh, dissertation talks about the interplays between the home front and the battle front and how these women are actively talking about politics, actively talking about military policy, writing to newspapers, writing to their husbands who are also writing back to them, writing to newspapers. It is a full on conversation and discourse that is happening between the home front and the battle front. And these women in New England have no problem voicing their opinion. Their husbands never ever tell them, you do not have a right to share your opinion. They, though they will sometimes say, honey, I'm at the front, please don't make a fight right now. And I hate to be kind of glib about that, but it's letter after letter saying, I get your point, I don't wanna argue politics right now. Um, but we absolutely see that women on the home front are playing a critical role and new, the, the conversations between newspapers on the home front are also feeding into this. One of the things I wish I got to talk about more is the fact that they, in almost every single regiment in the Department of the South, there are, uh, for a lack of a better term, wartime correspondents who are writing back home, talking about the regiment, talking about rumors, talking about specific charges, and it's just this flurry of politics. It really is. I, I never really... Um, understood just how big of a role that what we now call fake news and rumor and conspiracy theories play in the civil war to the point where you, uh, the fourth New Hampshire is absolutely trashed throughout the entire conflict to the point where Edwin Stanton directly intervenes in cashiers, soldiers, uh, because they go back home to New Hampshire, vote democratic and talk about it in public. And so it's this huge interplay between communities, the war department troops at the front all arguing about war aims, goals, conduct of the war, and it's an exceedingly messy situation, um, and everyone has a role to play. I hope that helps. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. So, Ian, if, if your mic doesn't work, maybe you can type into the chat um, your answer to Dr. Pinheiro's question about uh, uh, Black periodicals in the press and whether they commented on this. So as he is doing that, um, we have a really interesting question from the awesome Hillary Green, uh, who said that she really enjoyed these papers. And her question is, how might Joseph Reedy's framework presented in illusions of emancipation and notions of space, small and confined to large swaths, might reconsider the Civil War home front, civilian interactions with white and black soldiers and mobile nature of troops causes different experiences and interactions with white Southerners, Native Americans, and liberated African Americans. So notions of space and, and the framework. Is, does anyone have any response uh, to that while, while Ian is, is typing a bit? Uh, I, I suppose I'll, I'll, I'll jump in first. Um, uh, I, I... Civil War occupation, as, as Dr. Ash, who recently passed and he was a heavyweight in the field, noted that uh, occupation is roughly divided into spaces of garrison cities, no man's land, the Confederate frontier, and then the Confederate heartland, and how these spaces have uh, contained different experiences for different sets of people. But those are also uh, very based on where you are on the ground. And so one of the great things is taking a great framework like Dr. Ash puts forward and then seeing how it works at the local level. And I think what we're seeing is that by and large, a lot of his assertions hold true, but there are also all these little nuanced episodes in Virginia, in Northeast Florida, on the Gulf Coast that complicate this. And that's what I find, that's why I love about history is the fact that you have, you think you have a good answer, and then you go and look on the ground, it's like, this doesn't always conform. What do I do with this? And that just makes it all that much more fascinating, in my opinion. Yes, I mean, I, I would just agree with that. <laughs> because I think as we've seen, especially with, um, I'm just going to use guerrilla warfare as an example, you know, with all the fabulous work that's now been done on the Trans-Mississippi and what's going on in Missouri and, and that, and to compare what's happening there on the ground with guerrilla warfare that's happening elsewhere. And then as Ian brought up, you know, once you add in the USCT uh, into this, that just complicates it even further because I'm going to be honest, I didn't know most of those stories. So that was fascinating to me. And as somebody who studies guerrilla warfare from the Confederate side in Northern Virginia, 
that, as Eric just pointed out, I mean, it complicates the whole thing of what we kind of understood anyway. Um, and so, yeah, I think really space, you know, it matters. It matters where these things are taking place because, again, back to Dr. Manning's larger point, if we want to understand the big question, right, you've got to see how it, where it happens and how it's happening and who's involved because adding the USCT is now going to change kind of um, our understanding of, of guerrilla warfare in that way as well. <clears throat> And actually, I want to just throw in as I'm thinking about Hillary's question, another interesting thing is when I think about raiding strategies that are used in the Department of the South. Um, so Saxton and Hunter eventually use the first and second South Carolina for raids in Florida and up the rivers of the Georgia coast. Uh, and, and liberation is, is a key element of that raiding strategy. The spatial element to that is also very important because the territory is so, I mean, the Department of the South is Georgia, Florida, and South Carolina, right? This is this huge department with a lot of territory and a lot of also absence of Confederate army from that territory for much of the time period that we're talking about. So it's a space that's occupied by enslaved people, civilians, um, you know, ra raiding parties. And, and that makes for a very different dynamic where you have smaller contained departments where there are large armies operating within them. And that that creates a different dynamic. So I think that's an interesting, interesting question. So I hope everyone is looking at the chat and seeing that Ian uh, has commented that in terms of the commentary that he read, uh, African-American newspapers seem to situate black conduct in terms of both realizing emancipation and contrasting instances such as Darien with the, the atrocities of, of the Confederates. So do we have uh, any other questions? from our audience. I, I see we still have 40 people. So I hope there's, again, because I can't tell you audience how much I forced the panelists to be brief in their papers so that there would be time for audience questions. I, you know, I demanded, I gave them page links that they had to, to meet. I insisted that, you know, great conversation could still happen. <laughs> so, so I hope that uh, we can get another question besides that from Dr. Green. If anyone is still out there, because maybe for all I know, the numbers are up there, but everyone's gone and the six of us are just here. <laughs> no one is responding to me. So we can, we, you know, we can continue to have our own internal conversation. Let me make sure there's nothing in the Q&A. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm not seeing anything else. I mean, I can I just sorry, I'll have a Please question. Do. Okay. And I, this is for all y'all. Like, where do you envision going next? Like, Dr. Forrest, as you said that, like you already bring up something I'm gonna be working on in my second book, um, talking about Camp William Penn and the consequences of um, you know, Confederate invasions and taking, you know, free blacks. So it's like, where is these projects going one so I can cite them. Really, that's what I'm trying to get at. So all y'all like, what's the next step, really? Because <laughs> I need to cite them. Well, okay, so I'll go first. <laughs> so I need to finish fleshing out the stories of African Americans. So as you pointed, that's what I'm working on. <laughs> Uh, to kind of flesh this out. And then hopefully, I mean, it's, I'm working on this book manuscript, so it would be a, a, a community history of, of Fauquier. Um, and then my second project looks at Northern Virginia again, but post-war. So when these ex-Confederates come home, and um, again, Fauquier is a very, fairly wealthy county, so they, um, a lot of them fall under the requirement to apply for pardon. Um, so I've also been reading the amnesty applications um, which also then informs <laughs> the first project because a lot of those uh, applications fill in some of the holes like the Southern Claims Commission do for what everybody was doing during the war. Even if they're lying through their teeth, it still adds an interesting aspect to the story. Um, so that's kind of where I am. But yeah, it's right now it's kind of searching through to flesh out this story of um, the enslaved and where they're going and how they're claiming their freedom and how that's working. So I want to, so Dr. Totten, I do want to give you a chance to answer that question, but we actually have a very interesting question that's come in from 
uh, from Aaron Sheehan Dean that, that I think is very interesting and relates to the discussion. So, I, so he says, slaveholders in St. Augustine and women in uh, Farquhar both seem to have been surprised to find themselves in a war. Black soldiers, as Dr. Davis showed, adapted to a more dynamic notion of perpetual war, especially in U.S. campaigns against Plains Indians in the 1870s. Um, so my question is, whether you can identify whether or if the historical actors you study conceptualize themselves as being in a state of war. Uh, well, certainly for, I'm sorry, I'm going to jump in first. Um, certainly the troops, the Northern soldiers who volunteer for war in, in 1861 and 1862 do conceptualize themselves at war. And um, Southern civilians in Florida are also understand that they're in a state of war because one of the things I, I don't get to talk about is how the, the coast of Florida is basically stripped of troops thanks to Robert E. Lee, who has decided that uh, these areas are undefensible. It's easier to just defend the river systems that go move up into uh, Alabama and Georgia. And the, he's trying to conserve troops because it's just there's not enough men uh, on the coast. The civilians, many of them flee who can, and they take, it's the richest elements of St. Augustine who take many enslaved people with them. And it's only poor whites, Menorcans, and other individuals who are left behind. And they are the ones who have to now deal with these union occupiers. So they are very aware of the fact that their lives have been upended. They are now under military occupation. But like the women in Farquhar, they are very, very disruptive. Now, I didn't get to talk about this. I wish I had. But they do the same things that Farquhar women do. They throw insults. They chop, they chop down flagpoles so it can't have a U.S. flag on it. They routinely um, will harbor Confederate sympathizers. They'll do anything possible to show that they are rebellious against U.S. authority to the point where martial law is declared. And that's when harder war comes to Florida in later 1862, specifically under later regiments. The fourth doesn't seem willing to do that at first. It's only after they are reprimanded unofficially that you see the officers begin to realize we need to save face and we're willing to start moving towards this hard war direction. But it's later regiments who arrive from Massachusetts, New Hampshire, or, or Connecticut, really, that take a harder war perspective. So I would say in my specific case study, the people at war very much understand they're there, but they also understand that it's a space that they are negotiating, fight, uh, disrupting, and attempting. I mean, there's still conversations to be had about what war policy is. And these policies keep changing throughout the war. And it doesn't help that in the Department of the South, you have commander after commander after commander after commander who comes and goes, creating no consistent military culture or semblance of how do I stay out of trouble? That's a very long answer to a good question. Sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll just briefly say very similar. Um, my short answer is yes. I do think that they see themselves as being in a state of war. However, I will say, you know, they don't especially the white women, which are the, the reason I'm focusing on that is that's pretty much all that's left in Falkir. It's elderly men, kids, and then white women um, for white residents. Um, and they are not calling themselves soldiers, but the women do say things like, my tongue is the only weapon I have. Um, and so again, if we're going to parse words, they are not considering themselves combatants, but I think that fits with what we understand about gender and, and, and the, you know, just the way the 19th century works. Um, but I would say they also do not see themselves as simply sitting back and letting the, the men on the battlefield fight that these women are active agents of war. Um, but again, if we're going to be nitpicky, they, you know, they don't call themselves soldiers, but I don't necessarily think that means that they're not. Anyways, sorry, I don't, I don't, that's a fabulous question. We could spend hours talking about that and I would love to. But. <laughs> so, so we have three more good questions that the, let's try to do briefly in the last couple of minutes. So as kind of a follow up to that, um, can anyone speak to how white Southern women engaged around how unarmed black women and children were experiencing violence from white men? Uh, so in Fauquier, um, it's that... I haven't come across great examples. Um, enslaved people in Fauquier are constantly running away, but then what's unique in the 1862, some of them are coming back. Um, and so the white women are recording like, you know, two, two of their enslaved men went to the Union camp nearby. And then a week later they return 
to help her with planting. Um, and so again, this fluidity between all this is, is a little bit hard to track. So I don't have a great answer to your question because I have yet to come. I, I have no doubt violence is happening. Um, I just have not yet come across great ties to to that, to, to truly answer that question, because it just seems very fluid. And sometimes the white men are there and sometimes they're not. And so how those relationships are interacting, I'm still kind of working on fleshing out. Thank you. And please notice everyone, Ian has uh, posted in the chat one of his answers to the question to about uh, the state of war and recognizing that. So was there, uh, is there anything else that we can add about how um, panelists, you as historians are reconceiving lines between battlefront and home front. We, we've, we've heard a lot of that in, in Dr. Forrest's paper. Dr. Totten, can you or Dr. Davis briefly address your view of how you're kind of reconceiving those lines? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what, just to very briefly say, um, in St. Augustine, uh, to the previous question, women absolutely cheered on any violence that, that could happen against African Americans who fought for freedom. Um, and especially when black regiments become formed in Northwest and North uh, East Florida. In terms of reevaluating home front to the battle front, I am gaining a better appreciation to how political this war was and how it is being fought, not just on the battle front, but it's being fought in individual communities, in churches, in newspapers, and how the end result was never um, predetermined. I mean, if it were not for direct intervention by Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of War, cashiering several officers and helping promote a third party political movement in New Hampshire in 1862 and 1863, it's very likely that the Democratic Party would have won statewide elections, which would have created a, uh, a governor who was Democratic, several congressmen who were Democratic, and the man, one of the men who signed the 13th Amendment would have lost his seat who, um, uh, due to this electoral chicanery. And that would have had massive implications to the battlefield. There wouldn't, arguably, the 13th Amendment would have been harder to pass had it not been for these political actions in New Hampshire as their regiments at, at the battlefront are arguing about emancipation and the home front's arguing about it as well. So we, we've run out of time. We, I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of the, all of the questions, but we want to, to be timely because of commitments we know that everyone has. So thank you very much to all of our panelists for your excellent papers, for the excellent comments. Thank you for these great questions that we received. Um, and we hope everyone has a great conference and we thank you for attending and we're we're sorry we couldn't see who you all were, um, but we are so grateful that so many of you attended this panel and we, we look forward to a future discussion about all of the issues raised in, in, in this panel. So have a great day, everyone.